Welcome everybody to another episode of the Ibarra Exchange. We are in cycle two. This is episode three, November 29th, with my guest from Seville, Spain, Alejandro Ibarra. He's a psychologist, clinical psychologist, specialized in obsessive compulsive disorder treatment, telemedicine, telehealth, and psychoeducation. Uh, myself, Luigi Pesce, translational and behavioral neuroscientist uh, here in New York. Alejandro, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Luigi. Thank you for having me and for a new episode in the Ibarra Exchange. Absolutely. We're very happy to have you. Today, we're going to talk about a different concept that maybe it's unfamiliar for some uh, people, which is the, what we talk about abandonment. Okay, Abandonment, which is not following through with the process, with the intervention, with the clinical psychotherapy especially very important uh, in OCD with uh, uh, the expositions and the meditations and the cognitive behavioral training that patients usually go through and they succeed and they overcome and they move much better. So when we talk about abandonment as a negative connotation, as a non following through, we have to talk about the positive aspect of it, which is called adherence, okay? The ability and the likelihood that a patient will actually follow through and proceed with the treatment after session one or at any point uh, during the treatment. So how important you as a clinician, you see that is adherence? Do you agree with the studies? Do you have your own perspectives? Can you comment on that? Yes, uh, respect uh, the adherence in, in OCD treatment is a, a very important point, a, a very important key because it's one of the most important predictors in the adherence or in the follow through to the patients with the treatment in OCD, especially in ERP. Because remember that ERP is a, is a technique that work with, uh, continue work with follow, work with adherence, work with at least once or twice a week. So it's very, very important that the percent in adherence is very high. And in our practice office, in our, in our work here in Seville through telehealth, uh, we work hard every day to getting better the percent in adherence. So uh, the, it is a, a very important point and a, a very important predictor. Remember that I share with you a research for uh, Jonathan Raimovitz, that is one of the most expert, expert uh, psychologists in the field in OCD treatments. And this kind of research show us how to the adherence can get improved or get better the um, symptoms in OCD. Uh, doesn't matter if uh, OCD with ritual motors or in puro, for example, HOCD or ROCD. The, the most important thing is to continue working in getting better the adherence to um, like continue all the process with the final process in all to the recovery with the clients and with our patients. Yes, in the scientific paper, published paper that you, uh, that you share, Journal of Anxiety Disorders, it was definitely uh, understood that as a variable, as, as a predictor, um, what we call in, in Spanish, uh, vaticinio, okay? As a, as a predictor, yes, adherence was a, um, play a crucial role, was the highest uh, accounting factor for the ability to overcome and continue the, the treatment uh, successful, which obviously leads to the reduction in symptoms. However, I had a, and you touched briefly uh, upon that, I have a lot of questions regarding when people say there's an abandonment in the cognitive behavioral treatment of OCD, okay? I mean, it's a little bit unfair because there's an abandonment in the medical treatment of anything, uh, physical therapy or orthopedics, um, if people could walk out in the middle of surgery, they, uh, they would, but definitely also with the nutritionist. And so when you say there's a lot of uh, a abandonment in, in the treatment of OCD, as we were speaking in the Spanish video, who, what are the immediate disorders that 
it's it, it's been compared to is it anxiety disorders mood disorders yes mainly the uh, anxiety disorder as panic attack as ptsd and mood uh, depression for example uh, that is one one of that we can uh, compare with uh, OCD and this kind of, of treatment or of disorder. But the most important thing is that in OCD happen a little high percent in abandonment. So in our practice office, we work every day and every, every, every single day with some strategies to improve this process. Because the treatment in OCD is behavioral. It's not co cognitive. The ERP works because it is work with mm, behavioral. So it is important to, these strategies can mm, like mm, up to or high the percents in, uh, the, 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 the less percent in abandonment and the high percent in adherence. That is the main goal in OCD. Because when people, when uh, a sufferer, start or begin a process of recovery, the most important thing is continue all the process after four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, four months, six months, also one year. Until, until what? Until they conclude, until they finish all the process and the percentage recovery is higher than when comparative as they uh, become or they start in the, in the first and the main process. So that is very important. The adherence and um, reduce the percentage abandonment is very, very important. Absolutely, reducing the percentage in, in abandonment. Following that same thought process, there's gotta be a difference between the abandonment and adherence between the different types of OCD. Like I wouldn't imagine that a person suffering from um, as we spoke in many episodes before, uh, that people can see anytime right here in the website, um, pedophile OCD, homosexual OCD, relationships OCD. I wouldn't imagine that they're, you know, by simple common sense, that due to the, the strong impairment in the people's moral and ethics and the fact that it involves another person and then um, and the, the magnitude of what we call the, the labyrinth, the maze of, of the symptoms being locked within their own prisons. I will assume that there, there is a, low, a lower percentage of abandonment in these, at least in these three types of o, subtypes of OCD when you compare to the, the classic OCD, the more Asian type. Absolutely, absolutely, and good, good question, good your point of view. Because in, in OCD with ritual motors, for example, contamination when the people wash their hands and uh, symmetry, for example, and uh, checking doors or checking oven, uh, we see a high percent in abandonment comparing with Piro with HOCD, ROCD, POCD. So I think that is why, because in the, the people that suffer with ritual motors, with, for example, uh, washing their hands, uh, we see the rituals. And it's very hard and very difficult to the people and to the person that how continue all the process. And something, uh, um, some point that happened in the POCD, for example, or, or PRO, there is that this kind of OCD subtypes involves other persons, involves other people. All, all subtypes involve other people, but in POCD, HOCD involves normally their uh, parents, normally their wife or their husband. Mm -hmm. uh, in POCD, their children, their kids, their sons, okay, their daughters. So I think that is one of the, of the reasons uh, why in PO, uh, the people go through all the process until the, the final, until all the, the process to a recovery. Absolutely. It is, and when we talk about this specific type of disorders, it, is, it, it would be really unfair to blame, uh, to blame the psychologist for 
the abandonment or low uh, uh, adherence. It would be like, oh, the psychologist just didn't build rapport, didn't build the, the rapport, didn't build that connection at the beginning. So when you say that uh, you and your practice with your, uh, with your team and psychologists are using uh, or continue to create new strategies to re reduce the percentage in abandonment and increase the percentage in, in adherence that will ultimately uh, make the, the patient overcome their symptoms, reduce the, the, the impairment, being able to function in, in, everyday, life, in everyday life. Can you talk a little bit more about those strategies and techniques? Yes, one of, uh, of our strategies that we work in our single day, in our practice, in our clinical practice, is uh, with uh, mm, some days and some hours. For example, the sufferer, the, the person that we attend at Monday at three o'clock is the same person at Monday at three o'clock every, every Monday, for example. That, that, mm, like, that kind of strategies work that work in the brain and in the, in the mental condition to continue all the process at the same time on the same day. So there is benefit to the sufferer. And another, for example, is the poly, polite or poly, poly, mm, is, is that we, we, we use like strategies behavioral with uh, some person that doesn't connect at the same time. For example, if you are my patient at four o'clock and five minutes before your time, you said to me, I, Alejandro, I, I cannot connect today. So for example, you have to pay the session. That these strategies, these strategies is with the only main purpose to help you to continue your work with ERP. So in our practice and our clinical practice, we see that all the person that continue their process, their times, their hours, their days, continue all the process with ERP, they uh, continue until the final process, until the recovery, okay? And th these kind of strategies are 100% behavioral. So there are benefits to the patient and to the client, okay? There is a, an important, and I think no, no many psychologists work with this kind of strategy because it doesn't, it doesn't uh, learn, or we, we, doesn't, we, we don't learn this in the university or in the school, in the, in the medicine school, for example. We learn after in the, in the street or after with, the, with our practice office or with our clinical practice. So I, I think no many psychologists, psychologists, clinical psychologists work with this kind of strategy. If the, if the patient, for example, doesn't appear or they doesn't connect, okay, it doesn't matter, it's not my problem. No, it's our problem. It's our problem because part of my, of my, of my challenge with our, in, my, in our team and with the patient is that you, as a patient, as a sufferer, continue your work with ERP until your recovery. That is the Absolutely. point. It's not the same as canceling a, subs a, a subscription to a magazine or to a specific app or a specific social media platform that, that, that you're watching. You're at, you're, you're not strategy is logistical and it's an incentive. It's supposed to incentivize individuals to follow through, carry through, not some sort of punishment as in, yeah, if you don't come to the therapy, you cancel five minutes earlier, you have to pay it, which, you know, it only in, in my mind would be a, a little bit uh, disrespectful with the, with the psychologist and the therapist and with the other patient that couldn't actually book the time with the therapist because this person had it. But it's, it's more of a, a, an incentive, a boost. Uh, some sort of enforcement and saying, look, you really have to follow through your therapy and we're serious about it. We're doing this because of you. I think that from the operational and logistics level, that's a that, that's very good uh, strategy. Bringing back to the topic of abandonment and what has happened between these different uh, psychological disorders, we have seen an increase in mental illness in the, at least in the United States. Uh, almost on every group, almost on every, talking about depression and anxiety in children, in middle school, high school, college students, to uh, obviously an increasing domestic uh, 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 
violence and divorces that have been since April till now we see an, an extreme case of, of seasonal depression, but also depression due to the lockdowns, the, the pandemic, and also uh, an increasing addictions, whether they're alcohol, drugs, prescribed. Based on this, I will imagine when you compare your practice in Spain with 2019 and 2018, was there's got to be a, a difference, an increase for better or for worse in something. Yes, definitely. Uh, this mm, atypical year, this atypical year, we cannot compare with 2019 or 2018 because our different year. This pandemic uh, have earned uh, all people, all person to get improved and to create strategies to the mental condition and the mental health. So in our practice office, in our clinical practice, definitely we are looking at uh, increase in OCD, in PTSD, for example, in anxiety and in depression. Mm, since around the last five, five years, we continue working hard with all OCD communities since mm, 2015, 14. So we, we, we see a little increase this year because it's a year, a crazy year, because pandemic is not just in Spain. It's not just in the United States, it's in all the world. So OCD suffer are in all the world. So uh, we are looking at increase in OCD. Person who, for example, are with control symptoms that these kind of symptoms are increasing, okay? And person that Mm, with low evolution of the disorder, of the disorder get get worse with the symptom. So this uh, a typical year is a very very difficult year. So it's a an a typical year, and I think this year show to us how to how to learn, how to learn, how to how to challenge them, how to adapt. Mm, yes, how to adapt to the to the present and how to um, tolerate the uncertain future. Because we don't know what will happen in the few weeks, few days, few months, or even few years. We will, we will not, we, we will not, or we, we don't know. So that is important point to like to adapt to the present moment, to the present point and the present moment. And definitely to juggle and to manage a lot of things that are happening at the same time. And with the, uh, a lot of the, as you said, a lot, a lot of the uncertainty, what's gonna happen, is it gonna get, get, gonna get better? I have a couple of questions regarding them. Okay, you said com it's, we cannot compare it to 2019, but yes, we have seen an increase in the patients, perhaps in the vulnerability and the resistance to treatment. But on the positive side, you've seen an increase in the collaborations and the psychoeducation and the people that are jumping into using technology and to treat OCD and wanting to learn more about OCD, wanting to educate more the community. So the community of OCD in 2020 from uh, clinicians, therapists, pr uh, profess professors, doctors, it, it, have, it has increased. It's one, one of the positive aspects. But I'm curious to, okay, on a normal year, what happens with the, when we talk about the factor of weather, when we talk about the factor of the seasons and that do affect regularly, uh, you know, or do change your ability of going the outside or entertaining and keeping your mind occupied. Let's say in 2019, did you see any difference within the number of patients, the volume, winter versus summer, fall and spring? I, I think the last five, between five or eight years, we don't see a big difference between the season, okay? It doesn't matter if it is winter or autumn or summer. And maybe before that year, maybe uh, 10 or 12 years ago, even, okay? Even or maybe yes, but the last, the last mm, five or eight years, no. So, in this year, no. In this year, we, we look and we see an increase in all the in all the patients, in all the sufferers. Uh, also, we see an increase in the OCD online conference, the psychoeducation, in the treatment, in maybe 
also in some psychologists like a new era of psychologists that comes that that wants to study and research or about the OCD. So I I always recommend go to the United States, go to the IOCDF, go to the to the Center of Anxiety maybe in Philadelphia with Edna Foa and continue the studying, the studying in English because in Spanish the the information is is reduced. It's not the same due to uh, translation. There's a ceiling. Exactly, the translation is different. So go to a United States study and work to, to work hard to help to others in their recovery and in OCD recovery. No through work or study with one book. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I think and I recommend everybody, every psychologist or clinical psychologist, go to the United States and go to a OCDF and study the program with OCD Foundation. Before I ask you my last question, I just think just to touch a little bit on, on the point you just made, I think it's incredible that the fact that there are no differences on a regular year and that you haven't seen these differences be within the last eight to 10 years due to the season, due to the spring, winter, summer, I think it's just remarkable and speaks about the magnitude and the gravity and the seriousness of, of OCD as a psychological disorder and impairment. Because one ignorant person, you know, could argue that this doesn't happen when you have your mind occupied and you're entertained. So you, it's more likely to have it during the winter when there's nothing to do as opposed to the summer. But no, OCD, just like we say, doesn't discriminate between age, gender, um, class, social class status, ethnicity. It also doesn't discriminate the season, uh, between season as opposed to uh, mood disorders or uh, other types of psychological disorders that due to the lack of light, it might be a little bit uh, natural light. They might be a little more impairment. But just my last question, how can you keep your mind occupied uh, if you're in the United States in the, in the lockdown? What is healthy? What can you do? Uh, what are tips? What are tips you can do that when you're not at work and you're not at session, okay? You have that space, that, that gap in time that you're, okay, how can I do things that won't make you won't, you know, incentivize you or sort of like a bait in order to, to you to do the, uh, to follow the ticks and the rituals? Yes, uh, good and important question. Good and important question because three or, or four tips or strategies to getting better with the ERP. ERP is the main and the gold standard treatment. So um, between ERP or after ERP or also uh, between every session and another one, one, one of the most important things is continue working with mindfulness, mindfulness technique, it's a, a strategy. Uh, one of, of the most powerful strategies is practice mindfulness at least five or 10 minutes, 10 minutes, twice or three times a week, okay? And try to continue with your mind in the present moment. There are many metaphors to work with mindfulness. One of the, of the most powerful metaphor is the metaphor, metaphor of the CISO. Remember how the CISO, no? The CISO, sometimes you are in up and sometimes you are in down. So the metaphors in CISO, you, you can practice with your mind and with your thoughts that continue going to, uh, in your mind that it, it doesn't matter the answer, no yes and no no. So just continue in the mind like here, like in the middle. That is one of the metaphors that we practice, yes? That we Ma practice. Maintain the balance, maintain the, 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 balance. The, the, the focus, the center, okay. Exactly. One of the metaphors is the CISO strategies ERP, doing mindfulness twice or three times a week, very important. And go or hanging out, for example, depends of the, of the time here in, in Spain before uh, 6 in the evening, 6 p.m. So depends of the city of the country, but hanging out with your some friends or hanging out with mountain bike or just bicycle around two or three times, 20 to 30 minutes. Because for example, cycle uh, that is go to the gym or bicycle or training with weight is one 
of the most important strategies with, for example, ERP, with mindfulness techniques, with metaphors, and the four tips are going to help to the people to get better with the mental and physical condition. I mean, that, that is three or four specific tips. Playing chess is good. Yes. Playing chess, address. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes, maybe if the people can, uh, if, if you like, for example, if you like, you can, you can uh, play or play your guitar, for example, or watch TV, but you have to keep in going or looking forward, keeping movement, okay, keeping moving, because if you're keeping moving, your mind is going to be in the present moment. So that is wonderful and that is very powerful to your OCD recovery. Absolutely. Keeping motion, keeping go, keep it going, uh, keep the movement going. Absolutely important for OCD and for psychoeducation. Thank you so much, uh, psychologist Alejandro Barra, for another episode. This has been episode three, cycle two, focusing on adherence and tips how to get better. Uh, we'll see you for episode four. And thank you very much. Thank you, Luigi. Thank you for having me and continue working, continue forward and in moving very very important see you the next episode okay see you absolutely bye. thank you so much bye bye, bye, -bye.